Good afternoon. This is Dr. Naushira Pandya. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Geriatrics at Nova Southeastern University. I'm also director of the Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program at Kiran Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine. Today, I'd like to talk to you about care of diabetes in older adults. So a little different from the usual diabetes update. My disclosure is that I'm a speaker for Lily. The objectives of the talk today are to understand the challenges of diabetes management in older adults, and they come from many directions. We're also going to review the impact of hypoglycemia and strategies to avoid hypoglycemia. We're going to look at individualizing glucose goals in older adults who have various levels of health and comorbidities. And we're going to look at recent updates in pharmacological treatment, including the improvement of cardiovascular outcomes. So this is obviously now a big area of diabetes and diabetes and cardiovascular disease management is becoming very, very similar. There's a lot of shared space there. So older adults are disproportionately affected by diabetes six times more than younger people. And in the long-term care population, that's even higher. 25 to 34% of our residents have diabetes. Uh, Non-white residents are more likely to have diabetes. People with diabetes are more likely to end up in the emergency room in the prior 90 days prior to the study period and have a very high risk of pressure sores, as you can see. The cost of diabetes and patients in long-term care is very high, and even in 2012, it was over $19 billion. When you see one person with diabetes, you really see one person with diabetes. People with diabetes are a heterogeneous population, both clinically, their functional ability, cognitive status, socioeconomically, and the site of care. They have multiple comorbidities and their goals of treatment um, can vary. Uh, it can be to reduce complications. It can be comfort care at the end of life. So you really have to consider patients' values and uh, preferences when you're uh, talking about treatment and when you're really negotiating treatment. And of course, now the existing complications and uh, cardiovascular risk uh, comes to the forefront when we determine what therapy should look like. I like this because... Um, I tell people, you've never seen somebody with one diagnosis, right? That they just have diabetes. People with diabetes have autoimmune disease, cancer, cognitive impairment, liver disease, pancreatitis, higher risk of fractures, hypogonadism, sleep apnea, periodontal disease, and of course, a myriad of psychosocial and emotional uh, disorders. So that's the challenge. It's not just about glycemic management, but obviously looking at the whole patient. And in older adults, function and cognitive status and social support are very, very important. So let's look in more detail at the challenges of managing diabetes in older adults. And I like to group them in four buckets. So the first one relates to age-related factors. There's an alteration in glucose metabolism, as we know decline in renal function. In fact, two thirds of patients in long-term care facilities have CKD. Drug metabolism by the liver changes, they have functional limitations, mobility, they have sarcopenia, many are clearly frail, and improve, impaired hand dexterity and vision impairment can obviously affect how you manage the disease, especially if you're on a complex regimen. Then staff and practitioner challenges still exist. We have a variation of knowledge uh, in institutional settings. There's often a lack of team communication, failure to review glucose logs, definitely failure to individualize care. We still try to follow protocols for all um, residents and all of our outpatients. And we still do fail in stepwise and timely increase uh, in therapy when it's needed or simplification of therapy when that is needed. And I'll talk a bit more about that. 
The third bucket of challenges are health and psychological factors. So cognitive impairment and dementia may exist. There's a bi-directional relationship between hypoglycemia and cognitive impairment. Depression and anxiety are common. As we know, people don't come in simple packages. There are multiple comorbidities. And because of that, they may be on so many protocol-driven medications that you end up with a polypharmacy situation. Food intake is variable. And there's this real um, recognized problem of diabetes distress. The burden of the disease, the complications, the management, the self-care is too much. And there are actually scales by which you can measure diabetes distress. The fourth bucket is socioeconomic, lack of social support, access to food, uh, health insurance access, limited income, prescription expenses can be very high. Uh, care can occur in different care settings, so transitions might not be so smooth. And also the capacity of healthcare professionals in these different care settings may vary. And the primary care practitioner may be outside these settings, may not realize how different these settings are. So I'd like to look um, at nonspecific and some of the unique symptoms and syndromes associated with diabetes in the elderly. Uh, this can just slide by if you don't think of diabetes. So there's failure to thrive in terms of symptoms, confusion, new or worsening incontinence, infections, myocardial infarction or stroke uh, when hospitalized in dehydration. In terms of some of the unique syndromes that can present, and it may be hard to recognize in uh, elderly adults with diabetes, a neuropathic cachexia. This is painful neuropathy, pain leading to anorexia, depression and weight loss. Diabetic neuropathy may present early. And there's also papillary necrosis with pyelonephritis or UTI. You might get that severe proximal pain and nerve damage due to diabetic amyotrophy or just bully appearing in the hands and the soles or the uh, other areas of the feet. Shoulder pain, so frozen shoulder is very common in people with diabetes, osteoporosis and diabetic ketoacidosis. Some uh, older adults will present with diabetic ketoacidosis. And the ones we have to watch for are people who are on antipsychotics or SGLT2 inhibitors, where you might have euglycemic uh, ketoacidosis. So what are the goals of diabetes care in older adults? I've uh, grouped these from several sources, from the ANDA Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care, from diabetic medicine in the UK and from the ADA professional guidelines. So this is my take on it. It's important to individualize care by considering functional status, comorbidities, duration of diabetes. And in general, in older adults, glycemic goals can be relaxed. So I'll spend quite a bit of time on this. We need to still use evidence-based prescription for glucose lowering agents, but set appropriate targets for that individual who uh, we have to determine what healthcare status do they belong in? Are they healthy? Do they have chronic comorbidities? Or are they at a stage where just comfort uh, is important, maintaining function, avoiding hypoglycemia? So there has to be a proactive commitment to the reduction of cardiovascular disease, renal failure, loss of vision, worsening of cognitive impairment, mobility, frailty, and disability. Those are the things we're really trying to avoid. So screening for complications is particularly important and especially functional impairment. At every visit and at all times, we want to be vigilant about hypoglycemia and also we want to try and prevent unnecessary hospitalization. So what we're trying to do is uh, adopt a proactive approach to maintain that individual in as independent a setting as possible um, with optimal self-care and also optimal quality of life that matches their needs. <laughs> 
Here is an algorithmic approach um, to um, uh, assessing older people with diabetes. And I'll just go over this briefly. This is from Diabetic Medicine in the UK, but I think their principles really are very much aligned to what we would tend to do. So there's a pre-assessment phase right here with older adults with diabetes. You look at cardiovascular risk factors, functional status, renal failure, and also nutritional status. Very, very important. And you might detect some geriatric syndromes. And so after this assessment, you want to individualize the plan of care. And what do you consider while doing that? The risk benefit of certain glucose lowering agents, hypoglycemia risk, cost, their ability to handle complex regimens, and also where do they belong in the cardiovascular category? Are you going to select drugs which have proven cardiovascular benefit? And we certainly have those now. And you set site glycemic targets, and I'll show you some accepted you know, consensus goals. And um, look at anything that might decrease function and mobility, okay? So um, there is a separate position statement for patients in the long-term care setting uh, for the management of diabetes uh, in skilled nursing facilities and long-term care. This was written in 2016, and I was privileged to be a part of that. So one of the big things is to reduce hypoglycemia risk, because this is catastrophic. We want to promote the use of simplified regimens avoid the sole use of sliding scale insulin, liberalized diet, so carbohydrate consistency. We want to avoid dehydration and weight loss, so restricted diet should be removed and promote whatever physical activity we can. So what are the glycemic goals in older adults and how do we determine that? So there is a range and let me take you through this. Before we do that, I want to look at the concept of homeostenosis uh, with aging. So this diagram is very uh, graphic and helps to explain this. So as you get older, the physiologic reserves that you have at your means to restore homeostasis in the face of an injury, emotional, psychological stress, surgery, major infection, go down. When you're younger, you can bounce back because you have a lot of reserve. As you get older, that stress may exceed the capacity where you can go back to homeostasis. And so this is the problem why even older adults who are fit, we really have to watch out very carefully for their functional status, cognition, and their propensity to hypoglycemia. We know from quite a lot of data that older adults are overtreated. And this particular study from Anne Haines, which spanned 10 years, looked at three categories of older adults, relatively healthy, complex intermediate, and complex adults in poor health. No matter what healthcare status, about 60% of them had an A1C less than 7%, which is actually inappropriate. Okay, And when you looked at those achieving an A1C less than 7%, what were they taking? And for all three categories, the majority were taking insulin or uh, were on insulin or sulfonylureas. So again, that increases the risk of hypoglycemia and that adds to our concern about overtreatment. So I think that one of the main takeaway points from this lecture is know the glycemic goals in older adults of these different uh, health status categories and try and uh, you know, select those and come to a consensus you know, with your patients and most importantly, document that. So this is a revised framework for these three healthcare status, healthcare categories of patients, healthy patients, a reasonable A1C goal has now been determined to be between 7 to 7.5 percent, fasting or preprandial blood glucose 80 to 130, and a bedtime of 80 to 180. Now, complex intermediate patients in the second category have life expectancy, but the treatment burden is high. Their risk of hypoglycemia falls. They also have two or more impairments in instrumental activities of daily living, some cognitive impairment. So their A1C goal, and I akin those to assisted living patients, that's about 8%. Fasting and pre-meal glucose has been raised, 
and bedtime glucose 100 to 180. And those patients are in very poor health, such as nursing home patients who might require total care, not the rehabilitation patients, but these at end stage of their life, multiple chronic conditions, dementia, two plus impairments in activities of daily living. This is very significant. There is no reliance on A1C. So you need to look at glucose trends on the glucose checks, avoid hypoglycemia and symptomatic hyperglycemia. And their fasting goal has been elevated to 100 to 180 and between 110 to 220. In the skilled nursing facility, the framework is slightly different. So this comes from the position statement and you'll see some overlap. The important thing is those patients who are there for short-term rehab, like orthopedic surgery patients, have potential to go home. You still need to optimize glycemic control. But because they've come out of the hospital, you cannot rely on the A1C because you know they might have had a transfusion, uh, drop in hemoglobin, acute kidney failure. So you need to follow glucose trends and maintain them between 100 to 200. I've already talked about patients uh, in long-term care. In 2016, the goal of A1C was suggested to be 8.5%. And now you see there's currently no recommended reliance on A1C. Try to keep the glucose trends uh, between 100 to 200 or 100 to 180 if you can make it, okay? And the monitoring frequency depends on the complexity of their regimen, which is listed right here. Now, the last row, patients at the end of life, you really, uh, your goals are different. You're avoiding diagnostic therapeutic procedures. Your goal is comfort and uh, dignity. So there's no benefit in glycemic control, but you want to avoid symptomatic hyperglycemia and also hypoglycemia, of course. And there's no role in measuring the A1C in those patients. So the general guidelines for patients at the end of life are comfort and dignity, control distressing symptoms such as pain, hypo, hyperglycemia. We want to avoid dehydration and ER visits as well as hospitalizations that may not be necessary or unnecessary institutionalization. Dignity and quality of life is of course very important and we want to simplify treatment. So we're not going to do invasive diagnostic testing, including multiple glucose checks. And we need to respect the rights of patients and families. They may opt to refuse even insulin or glucose monitoring. Uh, and if that is their wish, that needs to be respected. Let's now move on to hypoglycemia. Classification of hypoglycemia first, I think is important to uh, understand. So there are now three levels, as I've uh, mentioned, and we talked about that a year ago. Level one hypoglycemia is less than 70 milligrams. And level two is clinically significant hypoglycemia, which is less than 54 milligrams. And level three is a severe event characterized by altered mental or physical status where the patient needs the assistance of another person. It does not depend on any glucose level. So of course, severe hypoglycemia is something we want to avoid at all costs. The risk factors for severe hypoglycemia are age, multiple medications, watch out for drugs like quinolone, non-selective beta blockers, not to say we would never use them, but we'd be vigilant. People who are on tight control, overly tight control, where we're trying to get the A1Cs less than seven, six or 6.5, erratic meal consumption. There may be errors in medication administration or insulin administration. Frequent use of sliding scale insulin, that's a big culprit end organ disease, gastroparesis can certainly lead to delayed emptying, and then hypoglycemia followed by hyperglycemia and endocrine disorders. The impact of hypoglycemia is very serious in older people. It can worsen neuropathic pain, especially if you try to lower blood glucose too rapidly. It increases the likelihood of falls and also cognitive impairment. Uh, increases the likelihood of hypoglycemia, but on the other hand, the flip side, hypoglycemia worsens cognitive impairment. And there's also data accumulating on 
uh, hypoglycemia causing cardiovascular events, hospitalization, and even mortality, uh, whether it's clinically mild or severe hypoglycemia. So I think you'll get the message that in older adults, this is something we want to avoid. Let's turn our attention to diabetes and dementia. So with type one diabetes, and that is still important. Uh, we haven't talked much about this in the past, but people with type one diabetes are living to an older age and some are being institutionalized. So with type one, there's also moderate slowing of mental speed and flexibility. The same occurs in type two, but there's also changes in learning and memory. And of course, the rate of cognitive decline is accelerated in people with type two. And very interestingly, type two diabetes or impaired fasting glucose is seen in about 80% of people with Alzheimer's disease. So there's a very uh, complex interaction. Here's a chart that just tries to identify uh, what are the determinants of the risk of dementia in people with diabetes? So I'll walk you through this. So diabetes with comorbidity, medication risk, perhaps hypoglycemia, and then what are the underlying mechanisms that could affect the brain? Atherosclerosis could cause strokes. Microvascular disease causes ischemia, and you see that as white matter disease on MRI. And glucose toxicity increases glycation end products, oxidative stress, and insulin actually decrease, increases the secretion and decreases the breakdown of amyloid. So all of this affects the brain by vascular mechanisms, enhanced aging of the brain, and an Alzheimer's type of uh, pathology, uh, which combine to increase the risk of dementia. I mentioned the risk of hypoglycemia and dementia. So this study very elegantly showed that the more episodes of hypoglycemia you get, the higher the risk of uh, incident dementia. And that was whether you adjusted for comorbidities, uh, mean A1C, whether they were on insulin treatment or not, the number of hypoglycemic episodes increased the risk of dementia. And that's a really significant problem. What are other predictors of impairment, uh, cognitive impairment and dementia in older people? So data from the Scottish Fremantle study in uh, subjects aged uh, 70 years and older, uh, these had uh, dementia as well as cognitive impairment. And they looked at the predictors of dementia. This were age, duration of diabetes, peripheral arterial disease. So who would have thought, you know, make sure you're checking their circulation. Exercise, of course, was protected. And in the case of Alzheimer's disease, but not MCI, the duration of diabetes was an independent predictor in addition to age and diastolic blood pressure for the risk of dementia. So, uh, so I look at dementia as a significant complication of diabetes. So since we're talking about dementia uh, and hypoglycemia, let's just review the treatment of hypoglycemia. Nothing much has changed. 15 grams of carbs, the patient can consume oral carbs, which can be half a cup of juice, applesauce, cup of milk, a tube of glucose gel, three glucose tablets. The thing is wait 15 minutes, check the blood glucose. If it's still low, repeat the 15 grams and then start looking for the cause of hypoglycemia. If the patient's unconscious, of course, you will treat with glucagon parenterally or intravenous dextrose if they're really impaired and you're in the correct healthcare setting. So I think that this is really important to always keep in the back of your mind. The ADA 2021 recommendations for hypoglycemia are the following. So episodes of hypoglycemia should be ascertained. So we need to ask at each visit, routine visit, and also maintain an ongoing vigilance for forgetfulness and signs of dementia. For older adults with type one, continuous glucose monitoring is now being uh, recommended to reduce hypoglycemia. Glucagon should be prescribed for everybody who has uh, an increased risk and noted blood sugars less than 54 milligrams per deciliter. And of course, the administration of glucagon is not limited to healthcare professionals, families, uh, family members, caregivers can be taught uh, to give glucagon. Uh, 
Hypoglycemia unawareness. So having symptoms, but not being able to react, not even knowing something was wrong till you're 35, 40 is very, very important because that uh, increases the episodes of hypoglycemia. And if you see that patient shows you a log where blood sugars were low, they didn't feel anything, that should trigger a change of regimen. You need to back off, de-intensify the regimen, allow the blood glucoses to come up and let the autonomic nervous system be sensitized uh, so that they can react to symptoms of hypoglycemia. I just wanted to take a minute to show you glucagon formulations and the store of scenery has changed. We're all familiar with the glucagon kit, which is somewhat difficult and at a panicky time, uh, difficult to get going in a timely manner. Uh, nasal glucagon trade name Baxemi has been released by Lily. So it's uh, very easy to administer a, a nasal squirt, can be given by the patient or a caregiver. And um, also uh, Zeris, uh, uh, the company Zeris has developed a pre-filled glucagon uh, pen, which is very easy also to administer. So the landscape is changing around administering glucagon. Let's now talk a little bit about blood glucose monitoring. So self-monitoring of blood glucose is still very, very important. And people who are on insulin and complex regimen should be encouraged to test based on the complexity of the regimen. So you could test prior to meals and snacks, bedtime, when you have symptoms of hypoglycemia, uh, before critical tasks like exercise or driving. And it is important for us as providers to be aware of the differences in accuracy amongst glucose meters. So only US FDA approved meters with proven accuracy should be uh, prescribed uh, with unexpired strips purchased from a pharmacy or licensed distributor. To continue with that, um, so when glucose monitoring is part of a self-management regimen, uh, it can certainly help you to guide the treatment to see the result of changes of treatment. And so this can be used for people who are obviously even using just basal insulin or BID insulin or even oral agents. Although self-monitored blood glucose is not being showed in patients with non-insulin therapy to improve the A1C, it can still be very helpful in terms of uh, addressing dietary changes, physical activity, to know the results of these changes, or when a medication change is made, you have a better idea of the effect of blood glucose. And I'll show you there are certain limitations to A1C testing by itself. So very importantly, how often should blood glucose be checked? There are really no specific guidelines, but in the long-term care setting, we've looked at the Nova Scotia guidelines and also uh, other literature uh, from the PATH program and come to a consensus where we feel in the institutional setting, if you're on a non-pharmacological or oral agent, um, non-pharmacological treatment or an oral agent, you could check in the first couple of weeks twice a day and once or twice a week afterwards. If you're on a simple insulin regimen, one to two a day, then initially check twice daily and three to four times per week. And uh, so this is strictly a recommendation in the long-term care setting. And if you're in a complex uh, regimen with basal and prandial insulin, then three or four more times a day. I want to show you the substances that can interfere with glucose readings. For, so for your usual glucose oxidase meters, uric acid, galactose, xylose, acetaminophen, L-dopa, and ascorbic acid can alter glucose uh, levels. And the, for the glucose dehydrogenase meters, icodextrin, which is used in peritoneal dialysis. So that won't be many of our patients, but readings can be altered. In the institutional setting, assisted living, group homes, I think it's important to provide staff with parameters on when to call the practitioner. So obviously if you have a glucose reading less than 70 and the honest, uh, or 70 and unresponsive, you need to call. Anything less than 70, don't wait to act on the hypoglycemia, but call the practitioner once the patient is stabilized. And then high values, 
don't, uh, you don't want to wait till your next visit or the next month or the next two months before treating high values. So we recommend that patients with two or more blood glucose values over 250 in, over, in a 24 hour period with a change of condition, practitioners should be called. If the values are over 300 on all or part of two consecutive days, the practitioner should be called. If the value is off the chart and cannot be read by the meter, and if the patient is clearly sick, vomiting, not eating, then the practitioner should be called. So these parameters could be placed in a standing order set, and I find that that's useful. Again, just to remind ourselves that the A1C is not everything. It gives you an idea of glycemic control. It does not give you an idea of glucose fluctuation. So a continuous glucose monitor is probably the best way or a well-kept glucose log. So an A1C may be uh, artificially increased by hypothyroidism, splenectomy, low turnover conditions, hemoglobin variance, and we have a case of hemoglobin wane in which a patient was polycythemic and had high A1Cs, iron deficiency. A1C can be decreased with anemia, blood loss, transfusions, uh, hemodialysis, uh, uh, hemolysis and red cell turnover race. Caucasians have 0.3% lower A1C than African-Americans, pregnancy and erythropoietin. So it's very important to interpret the A1C in the light of the clinical situation of the patient. And if the A1C and the glucose logs don't make sense or that they are not congruent, look at the glucose logs. And if you're fortunate to have a CGM, look at that. Let's now turn our attention to pharmacologic therapy for type two uh, diabetes. And I'll actually uh, review and I apologize for this. I'm also going to combine all the recommendations and focus on the 2021 uh, summary recommendations. So metformin is still the preferred initial agent, even for older adults, if their renal function allows it. Don't forget, you can continue it as long as it's tolerated, as long as the renal function comorbidities allow it, including when they're on insulin. Don't forget to check vitamin B12 levels if they've been on metformin for a long time because absorption is affected. However, if the A1C is high, you may need combination treatment. So don't wait too long for the metformin. If your A1C is nine or higher, you need combination treatment. And sometimes you need insulin right away. And in sick patients, you should not wait uh, to escalate oral agents. So the early introduction of insulin is important in people who are catabolic, losing weight because they're so hyperglycemic if they're symptomatic with hyperglycemia, if the A1C is over 10% and blood glucose levels are over 300 milligrams, you should definitely start insulin and ask questions later, as I say. To continue with pharmacologic therapy, again, as I mentioned, a patient-centered approach, look at their cardiovascular, renal complications, comorbidities, risk of hypoglycemia. Are they at risk of weight loss? Do they need to lose weight? Uh, preferences also. Now, the most important thing that I put in bold is in patients with type 2 who have established ASCVD or have multiple higher uh, risk indicators, uh, kidney disease or heart failure, an SGLT2 inhibitor or a glucagon-like uh, peptide receptor agonist, uh, so a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven benefit from the studies that we have, is recommended independent of the A1C. And that's a level A recommendation. So if they have these complications, no matter what the A1C is, you can add this drug to metformin. Or if you can't take metformin, use one of these agents, okay? To continue with this, another key recommendation, which has been around now for a couple of years, is in patients with type two, a GLP-1 receptor agonist is preferred to insulin. So once you've reached like two or three oral agents, you're still not at your goal, then um, start a GLP-1 receptor agonist instead of basal insulin. Don't wait to intensify treatment if the treatment goals aren't met. Let's say the blood sugars are 250, 300, the A1C is even above the goals for older adults, then don't wait uh, to um, you know, uh, uh, to see how things go, to advise diet, to advise exercise. While you're working on lifestyle, 
start intensifying treatment and evaluate the medication compliance at every visit. I think that that's really uh, an important issue. This is a complex chart, but this is the 2021 uh, recommendations uh, for um, therapeutic regimens. So first line therapy, and I'll point this for is still metformin and lifestyle. And then if they have any ASCVD, CKD or heart failure, then the choice is totally different. So with metformin, regardless of the A1C, uh, independent of the A1C, if they have heart failure, especially low ejection fraction, you're going to choose an SGLT2. Okay. If they have ASCVD and risk factors, you can either choose an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So like the once a week, uh, like um, dulaglutide or semaglutide, you could use that. Okay, and if they can't tolerate one, switch it over to another. And you can actually combine these two agents if you haven't achieved your control. And then you can go to a TZD and a sulfonylurea basal insulin. Remember, if somebody is on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, you cannot have them on a DPP-4 inhibitor as well because they both have similar modes of action. We talked about the heart failure. What about somebody who has CKD, no other cardiac problems? Then an SGLT2 inhibitor. So this class of drugs has the strongest evidence uh, for reducing cardio uh, renal endpoints. And, um, and if that's not tolerated or diabetes is so progressive, you can add a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Now, if you don't have ASCVD, renal failure or heart failure, then in addition to metformin, you can add any of these drugs depending on your um, A1C goal and what the blood glucose readings are. DPP-4 inhibitor next, and then you can add an SGLT2 or a thiazolidine dione and so forth. So if you're on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, you can add an SGLT2 inhibitor or TZD. And um, notice that sulfonylureas are very low on the list here, okay? So start one of these and then add one from another category. There is a need to minimize weight gain. So you're trying to lose weight. SGLT2 inhibitors will cause some weight loss, so will GLP-1 receptor agonists. But most of the indications are not for weight loss alone, okay? If the uh, A1C is still above your target, then you add the opposite drug, GLP-1, then you add an SGLT2 and so forth. And then you can add your other oral agents and if necessary, basal insulin. Now, if cost is a major problem, then your choice is limited because you can give a sulfonylurea or a TZD. And if the A1C is above the target, then the, uh, the second drug in the same two categories and then basal insulin. So the choice is limited when um, uh, cost is an issue, okay? A few words on insulin therapy. I want to just uh, reiterate the brands of uh, intermediate and long-acting insulin. We're familiar with NPH, both Novolin and Humulin. We are familiar with Glargine and Levodetomir, which are long-acting insulins, basal insulins. Now we have Tujeo, which is insulin Glargine, three times as concentrated, 300 units per ml. It's available by pen. So if you're on large doses of glargine, you can use a concentrated version. The onset is a bit later, but it lasts longer, as you can see here. We also have insulin Degludec, brand name Tresipa, which is 200 units per milliliter. And uh, that's also in a pen. Onset takes a little bit more time, and but it lasts even 42 hours. So this is something that we've been able to add to the armamentarium of diabetes. Nothing all that much has changed with rapid acting insulin or short acting insulin. Of course, we also have U500 insulin, which is produced by Lilly for patients who have very uh, high glucose variability and need large doses of insulin. Okay. This is just a chart from our long-term care guidelines to help the practitioners who are new to the setting know what to alter. So for instance, if your fasting blood glucose is low, you're on a complex insulin regimen, you lower the basal. 
if pre-lunch is low, you want to lower the breakfast mealtime insulin and so forth. If bedtime is low, then you want to reduce the supper time insulin. So it just provides some guidance for practitioners who are new to this setting. The most important thing uh, I think is not to micromanage blood glucose. Look at trends. Don't change your whole regimen because you've got a call at night and the blood sugar is 350. Yes, you might have to deal with that, but stand back and at the next visit or next few days, look at the glucose log and adjust the whole regimen if necessary or figure out what the problem is. And so you want to look at the glucose trends and um, not follow the A1C alone. You want to combine those two pieces of information together. And I showed you that the A1C uh, by itself can be falsely elevated or falsely reduced in some clinical conditions or with some medications. So in the office setting, I really request them to bring their glucometer or their glucose log. Um, a lot of people have uh, excuses and I ask them to call or fax in their glucose log because it's difficult to make changes. A1C still perform twice a year if things are at goal or every three months or quarterly if not. And in the clinic setting, if you have point of care A1C testing, that can be very helpful. Um, so I just want to again remind you of the BEERS criteria while we're touching on the subject of sliding scale insulin. This is uh, something that is considered inappropriate in older adults and there's a clear recommendation to avoid sliding scale insulin. There's a high risk of hypoglycemia without improving hyperglycemia, regardless of the care setting, especially if you don't have basal insulin on board. So it's really a reactive approach. The other drug is gliburide. So in the uh, institutional setting, we would use glipizide, uh, which is not renally eliminated. Gliburide has a high risk of prolonged hypoglycemia. So I often get the question, so what do we do if somebody's on sliding scale insulin? So let's say they're on sliding scale insulin alone with some oral agents. Look at the total daily dose of sliding scale insulin over the past week give 50 or 70% of that total daily dose as basal insulin, okay? So that becomes your basal dose. Stop the sliding scale insulin, that takes courage. And then once you're on the basal uh, insulin, look at the fasting glucose and increase or decrease it by two to four units, depending on you know, whether your fasting is low or high. Okay, so this is a simple way to get rid of basal insulin. Uh, Dr. Amunshi at Johnson Diabetes Center and the ADA have done a significant amount of work on de-intensification and simplification of therapy in older adults. So I'm going to just look at de-intensification. Who would you de-intensify therapy? These are people who are experiencing diabetes distress and increased burden of therapy. So if they're having trouble, difficulty adhering to a regimen, effects of polypharmacy, they're developing dementia or certainly at the end of life. Why? Because we want to improve adherence, uh, fewer side effects and lower the treatment burden. We really want to reduce the treatment burden, especially for somebody who has no caregiver support or might have a stroke or hand weakness. How do we do that? We remove non-essential agents like glipizide and even metformin uh, Long-acting formulations like basal insulin or once a week GLP-1 receptor agonist might be very helpful. And medication reconciliation at each visit, that is crucial. They need to bring in all their medications uh, because you might be making adjustments based on labs without realizing that they're not actually taking the medication. And also look at antihypertensive medications. Is your goal too strict? Uh, statins? Are they going to benefit uh, from statin therapy if they have multiple comorbidities or they might be at the end of life? What is simplification? So that is to uh, simplify treatment to match the coping ability and the skills of the patient. So here you're looking at the patient themselves. If they can't handle complex regimens, certainly not basal, prandial, and sliding scale. If glucose levels are all over the place, they're experiencing diabetes distress. You want to simplify the regimen. And that's so the patient and the caregiver can actually follow a plan consistently, and we can reduce the risk of hypoglycemia.
So here you might consider non-insulin regimens such as GLP-1 receptor agonists, or even an addition of an oral medication, simplification of diet, and uh, some simple exercise recommendations. So de-intensification and simplification have now become part of the lingo in managing diabetes in older adults. And it shows that you have to get to know your patients, their support system, what, what are they able to manage by themselves? What additional help do they need? Are they getting fed up? Are they getting dejected? Are they just missing doses? So this is um, a regimen that Dr. Uh, Munshi and a uh, group have developed. Uh, it's an algorithm to simplify insulin uh, for older people with type two diabetes. So I'll just go over part of it. If they're on basal insulin, you can change that from bedtime to morning. That will reduce the risk of hypoglycemia and match caloric intake. Uh, look at the fasting goals. Make sure that your goal is not too tight. And if they don't reach that goal, you increase it by two units. If they've exceeded that goal, you go to um, down by two units. Okay. And if 50% of the finger stick glucose is over the goal, you go up by two units. And if they're below 80, you go down, okay? So mealtime insulin, this is the middle section. What can you do? What we're trying to do is reduce breakfast, lunch, dinner, insulin dosing for older people. So if it's over 10 units per meal, try to reduce the dose by 50% and add a non-insulin agent. If the mealtime dose is less than 10 units, you might as well stop it and use a non-insulin agent, okay? So if your GFR is allows you to use metformin, if it's over 45, go ahead with that. If the GFR is less, then go to a second line agent. And here you can use a GLP-1 receptor agonist. You know, certainly you might start to stop one or two meals per day. Okay, and also the number of finger sticks will decrease. Okay. Uh, just a bit of focus on the role of second uh, generation uh, basal insulins that I mentioned the uh, insulin degludec and uh, glargine, uh, which is glargine 300 units per ml. So the trade names are Traceba and Tegeo. What's the advantage? So second generation basal insulins we know have a longer duration of action and I've gone over this. They, because they're concentrated, the volume of injection is low. So I see that as a benefit in patients who are in say 100 units of glargine a day, 120 a day. That's a lot of volume of injection if you use U100. So this is where uh, the new second generation basal insulins uh, can be handy. And there is also uh, other data besides reducing volume of an injection, it reduces glucose variability. So it smooths down the trends, okay? And this might allow us to actually discontinue prandial insulin. There are several studies that now show that there is less hypoglycemia with these second generation basal insulins. So lower estimated rate of overall confirmed hypoglycemia and 36% lower nocturnal hypoglycemia in this one study in, from 2013. And in patients who are over 65 years of age, hypoglycemia incidence was lower in those treated with glargine 300 compared to the usual glargine. And I have had, it, in my own experience, my patients uh, tolerate this extremely well. And the, the nice thing is they come in a pen that uh, obviously allows you to, you know, just dial up the required dose. There's no calculation. Let's look at uh, in a bit more detail and studies that show improvement of cardiovascular outcomes. So the 2021 recommendations are so pretty much what we're familiar with. In patients with known ASCVD, consider an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker to reduce the risk. Prior MI, use beta blockers for at least three years after the event. It used to be two years. Okay, and I talked to you about heart failure. Metformin could be continued if they're stable, if the EGFR is over 30, but should be avoided in unstable or hospitalized patients with heart failure. And of course, patients with established uh, ASCVD or CKD are choices 
uh, go first to an SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist. These are some of the trials, just to give you the big picture of uh, how these cardiovascular outcome trials fared with different drug categories in mind. So these are all the trials with DPP-4 inhibitors. They were all neutral. There was no significant um, benefit or worsening of cardiovascular outcomes, whether you use saxagliptin, alloglyptin, linagliptin, whatever. With GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, liraglutide had positive outcomes, so did semaglutide in the SUSTAIN trial, uh, dulaglutide in the Rewind trial, and albiglutide in Harmony. So GLP-1 receptor uh, agonists, most of those uh, were uh, positive in terms of improving cardiovascular outcomes. Now, when you look at SGLT2 inhibitors, that they have performed extraordinarily well. And most of this dapagliflozin, canagliflozin, uh, empagliflozin uh, have shown positive cardiovascular outcomes or benefit. The latest study using urtagliflozin, which is now covered by several insurance companies, showed that it was non-inferior to placebo. So I guess that wouldn't be my first choice. Okay, I won't labor this. This is just data on GLP-1 receptor agonists. Again, this is a repeat of what I showed you in the cartoon-like uh, diagram. But other than uh, exenatide and lixizenatide, they all performed well. And the same with uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, yeah, in terms of renal outcomes, um, all very positive here, significant, statistically significant improvement, except for urtagliflozin, which was non-inferior. I want to spend a few minutes talking about this really important area that has developed of study, uh, research, and of clinical importance. And that is of COVID-19 and diabetes. Many questions still exist. So the data so far, what do we know so far? And I've just summarized it. I, there's too much information to give you all the data. So right now, there's a big question. Are people with diabetes more likely to get COVID-19 than the general population? And the answer is there isn't enough information to say that. However, people with, two, with diabetes are two to three times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19. So if they have COVID-19, two to three times more likely to be hospitalized or have critical illness or die. Hazard ratio of disease severity and poor survival is worse than people with diabetes. The hazard ratio is 2 to 2.3. ICU admission uh, and the risk of infection is higher in racial and ethnic minorities, but actually not mortality in a large uh, meta-analysis, although I know locally we're hearing uh, different information. What about other comorbidities along with diabetes? It's not just thought to be diabetes alone, but the coexistence of hypertension, CKD, cancer, stroke, that seems to be associated with disease severity. And long-standing diabetes, the longer you've had the disease, and those with type 1 sadly seem to have worse outcomes. Other problems with COVID-19, is it responsible? Is it a new type of diabetes? We don't know that yet. There's some intriguing you know, writing in the literature. COVID-19 is associated with hyperglycemia and ketoacidosis. That is seen clinically due to metabolic stress, uh, insulin resistance, and over counter-regulation. So the body systems, uh, glucagon, cortisol, uh, rev up and raise the blood glucose extraordinarily. So the other thing is diabetes and uncontrolled hyperglycemia. So diabetes and or uncontrolled hyperglycemia are associated with higher mortality. Blood glucose levels over 180 were associated with worse outcomes in the first studies in the Hubei province. So what do you do with um, people who have diabetes in acute settings or people with COVID in the acute setting? Make sure they're not diabetic. Screen everybody for diabetes. Doesn't matter who they are, screen them for diabetes. Pay attention to their electrolytes. And if they're sick or bicarbs going down, check the ketones and beta hydroxybutyrate. 
okay, liberal use of IV insulin is recommended because most of these drugs are not, oral agents are not recommended. If the patient has a CGM and insulin pumps, if they're already on one, use it. Uh, and so they should be uh, using it in the hospital setting. Sulfonylureas, TZDs, glucosidase inhibitors, and SGLT2 inhibitors are not generally recommended. Metformin and GLP-1 receptor agonists should not be used in the critical care setting. There's a lot of debate about ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers because the virus enters the lung parenchyma through the ACE receptor. But studies have actually showed that the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs reduce mortality in hypertensive patients with COVID. And dexamethasone has been proven to improve outcomes and reduce hospital stay. And while you have to pay more attention to glucose levels on people with dexamethasone, they're equally beneficial. A word about continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, you have real-time continuous glucose monitoring that uh, measures and displays glucose levels continuously. So the patient just has to look at their reader. Uh, and the, one of the brands, of course, is Dexcom. The intermittent scan is freestyle, and they just wave the reader over the sensor to give an immediate reading. And you need to rec uh, you know, review that three or four times a day. This is just a, an example of an ambulatory glucose profile, a reading that can be uh, uploaded uh, to your computer or the patient can send it to you. This is a report of how they're doing on CGM, how much time do they spend on the sensor, time in range, 70 to 180, should be 70%. Over 180, we want them to be there only 25% of the time. Less than 70, we don't want them to be there more than 4% of the time. So this is an example of a, a, a report that you'll get. CGMs are effective in older uh, uh, adults. They've shown to cause uh, reduction in A1C monitor, uh, levels uh, from 5.1 to 2.7%. Um, uh, so uh, CGMs seem to be definitely helpful in older adults. I would use it for somebody who had a lot of glucose variability, risk of hypoglycemia. Transitions of care, very important. Uh, and that patients can go through multiple care settings with multiple specialists and health care professionals, you know, taking care of them. And uh, length of stay has decreased. 30-day readmissions for people with diabetes is much higher than for other hospitalized patients. So I'll skip the risk factors here. And I've just prepared a checklist for your review on what you should check from hospital to the long-term care or rehab setting and from uh, that setting to home. So this is just a checklist of all the uh, problems that you should look at, the information that has to go with the patient to the next care team. And from there to home, how often to monitor, how to treat hypoglycemia, have them practice their own, administering their own insulin or GLP-1 when to call the facility or their PCP, what is their next uh, appointment date. So all that is really very important because otherwise the patient gets lost in the system, ends up in the emergency room and gets readmitted. So just to remind you, insulin um, injections, we're now uh, not angling the needle, we're going vertically down. You don't need to pinch the skin unless the patient is very thin. Our recommended needle length is four to five millimeters, even a three millimeter pen needle. If you can prescribe it, that is much better and it avoids intramuscular injection. And please remind the patient to rotate sites uh, because they um, often they use the right and left lower quadrant and this is what you get. You get lipoatrophy and lipohypertrophy if they just use the same site irregular insulin delivery, and very erratic blood glucose levels. So I'll finish there. I thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to deal with any questions. Thank you so much.